Hello and welcome to the Shiny Bees podcast, a podcast for those who like their knitting, comedy and yarn in equally large measures. I'm your host, Joel Millmine, and this is episode 155, Must Knit Vintage Patterns from A Stitch in Time 2 by Susan Crawford. I feel a need to laugh again with you, if that's alright. I need a drink, I need a friend, I need your help. Hello, hello, and welcome to episode 155 of the Shiny Bees podcast. Today is Tuesday, the 18th of August 2020, and I am Jo, I am your hostess, and I'm back again with another episode of the show. If you're a new listener today, welcome, and if you are a returning listener, hi, good to have you back with you again. And today I'm going to be talking about vintage patterns, particularly um, vintage patterns from A Stitch in Time, Volume 2, which is a book by Susan Crawford Vintage. And I spoke about this a few episodes ago. Basically, I was talking about getting a mini, getting blonde hair again and wearing vintage clothes again, a la Joe in 2004 at uni. I'm still waiting on the mini, not found the right one yet. Why Why do people buy automatic minis? Surely the whole point of a mini is that you want to actually drive it with a gear stick. Um, so yeah, I haven't found a mini yet. I want a red one and apparently they're quite hard to sell and people never buy red ones. So there aren't that many around to, to be getting. I do have the blonde streaks. And I am looking, or I've overhauled and thrown out a load of stuff out of my wardrobe. I've been doing a little bit of decluttering during, well, we're not re-locked down again, but pretty much everyone else I know is is on restrictions again. So I've been clearing out stuff that just doesn't fit very well, that I don't like anymore, that isn't useful to me into piles to be got rid of and been thinking a lot more about creating a wardrobe that is more capsual in nature but is also a bit more me really and a bit more fun to wear with a lot more uh, handmade clothes or vintage clothes or whatever else just rediscovering my style I guess after the obviously when you have kids you kind of like just sit there wearing playing t-shirts and looking a little bit haggard and knackered um for a decade or so or oh, I have anyway I don't know about anyone else I have and um I'm just a bit done with that really so I mentioned that I was going to go through and have a look for some patterns in this particular book because I used to be incredibly fond of wearing vintage clothes not girly girly vintage clothes so not like tea dresses or anything like that I wasn't a victory rolls in my hair kind of girl I pretty much embraced the sort of 70s cord flares velvet jackets um, and man-made fibers in the old large collared shirt department and was a very vigorous patron at the pop cafe in Manchester on Oldham Street which is still there as far as I know, and did a mean line in really comfy and nice corduroy flares in every colour you can pretty much think of. So I was always basically in there getting flares and buying vintage shirts and in Affleck's Palace buying vintage shirts and spent a lot of time with uh, tank tops, all sort of I wasn't knitting again at that point. So they were all kind of machine knits and from various high streety type stores. But when you paired them correctly with the right kind of shirts and stuff, they can look really cool. I think they were from Bay. I don't think Bay even exists anymore, but I have a very clear memory of me and my bestie Sal having matching pink V-neck tops, um, jumpers, so what do you call them? Vest? Do you call them a vest? But that's not what we call vests in the north, but like a v-neck a tank top we call these in the north. So it was a v-neck tank top and it was pink, sparkly pink, lurexy tank top. We had matching ones and I don't have them anymore, sadly, but I do still love the whole idea of it, especially as you get into autumn soon and 
being able to have that kind of single layer over the top of a shirt or something is quite handy. So I decided to have a mooch through a stitch in time too. I have a copy of this book to select and find some of the more wearable pieces that I would like to add to my wardrobe over the next short while and talk about how maybe you can make some of them a little bit more accessible and less vintagey. The styling and everything in this book is beautiful, like it's really good, but it is very vintage and that can sometimes put you off when you look at it and you think, oh, well, I don't wear vintage, so, you know, maybe this isn't for me. And actually there are quite a lot of pieces in there that if they didn't have the vintage styling, you would not think they were vintage. So I thought I will pick out five of my favourite patterns from this particular book, A Stitch in Time Volume 2, which is by Susan Crawford. So that's going to be what I'm talking about today. So get your knitting, get your rooibos or whatever it is else it is you are going to be having with your knitting and we shall crack on with the show. So as I mentioned in the intro today, I'm going to be talking about some vintage patterns from A Stitching Time Volume 2 by Susan Crawford Vintage. You can find um, everything to do with this book at susancrawfordvintage.com. I will put links in the show notes and the show notes as always will be shinybees.com forward slash episode number. And today's episode is number 155. Cool. So I decided to pull out A Stitch in Time volume two because this one goes from the 1930s to the 1960s. There is a Stitch in Time volume one as well, which is an equally thick and beautiful book filled to the brim with vintage patterns and I've gone for this one because I mentioned in the episode a couple of episodes ago about the Jan sweater and I've had this one on my list for ages so that's why I decided to go for this book to have a look through and pick out some pieces that I really want to add to my wardrobe over the next short while and been thinking about which which order to do them in basically. Now I really like the Stitch in Time books because they are a proper thick hardback book. They're like a proper coffee table, really nice book. And they contain lots of information about vintage knitting, which I find super interesting. So they talk about how in the different eras, different trends became established because of various kind of socioeconomic factors. So for instance, in the 40s, most of the designs didn't have very many buttons because they weren't readily available and um, all of the metal was being used for the war effort. In the 1950s, when they were a lot more available and they had things like plastic and Bakelite buttons, they, they became a lot more popular in designs. So you went from sort of three buttons through to having lots of buttons because obviously the landscape in which people were crafting and were creating these items was different and obviously we all love knitting something that looks beautiful and we enjoy the knitting and sitting there but I really also like the historical aspects that go along with this I think it's super interesting Susan is a knitting historian as well she used to teach fashion and um, so all of the styling is super beautiful and on point what I also like is she also gives all of the kind of the old rules of thumb that we use for adjusting patterns to fit. So um, if you've got a bigger bust but a narrower waist or a broad back but a flatter chest, there's a page that gives all of the different rules of thumb for adjusting the patterns to accommodate that. Now it's important to understand, because some people really hate this, that all of the pieces all of the patterns in this particular book are sewn in pieces and then they're assembled afterwards. And there's also a set of instructions for what order to assemble the pieces in. I know a lot of people don't really like that these days and it's become really fashionable and popular to have non-seamed garments because, I mean, seaming is a bit of a pain in the bum. It's not the most exciting part of the knitting process. 
However, if you have a seamed garment, you've got a lot more opportunity to adjust the pieces to fit correctly because you can adjust them in, in a very similar way to adjusting sewing patterns a lot more readily than something that's knit in one piece where you are at the behest really in many respects of the grading of the garment and also it means the design of the garment it has to be simpler for a non-seamed piece compared to one that is done in pieces and you can adjust and add different design features some of which I have picked out in here in particular as as something like quite cool and different so I will start with my first most favourite, which is the Jan sweater. I've spoken about this one before. It is knitted in Exelana 4 ply, which is Susan's own wool. As you would expect, a lot of the designs are in this particular wool. And she developed this wool to mimic a lot of the qualities of the wools that were available and that were used when these knitting patterns were originally designed. So... You get a lot of them in this. You get a lot of, of the patterns in Jamison's as well. These are slightly more robust, stickier wools. They're good for fair isle. They've got that stickiness that you don't necessarily get with other wools. And in this case, I think that, you know, maybe it isn't that necessary for it to be a sticky wool because it's not a fair isle piece. So the Jan sweater, it's short sleeved. It's got an eyelet, a V eyelet pattern on the front and the back and it's got a boat neck. It is knitted in pieces and then seamed. As I've said, all of the pieces are done like that and I would not do it in the colour that it's done in. It's done in, a, I think it's called powdered egg. It's a pale yellow, very, very vintage palette shade and it's very pretty. I would look like I'd been dug up if I wore that colour I can't really wear yellow and still look like I'm alive and I would probably do it in something a little bit more jewel toned so I would swap it maybe for an emerald maybe more likely for a sapphire or a purple and I would look to knit it in something a little bit more luxe to be honest I would go for maybe a 50 50 wool silk something like that and you know, get a little bit more drape and a bit more slinky, perhaps. Obviously, it would all depend on the tensions and everything else like that. But I could definitely see it working in, you know, a really nice hand dyed or in some sort of commercial but similar um, blend. So maybe like an Eden Cottage Yarns. Um, their BFL silk blend would be Milburn it's called would be a good option for this um, and there are some kind of quite jewelry tones in that I think Midnight Sky springs to mind immediately that I think would make it look quite cool I would love to see you know some sequins on this <laughs> frankly it's really cool it looks actually it's not a 70s piece but it does look quite 70s I think you could add some beads and make it quite funky and yeah, I think it'd be really cool, that pub top, like a top for wearing to the pub, maybe in winter. It would be very cool for. So that is the Jan sweater. I'm super keen. I'm super keen to cast that on. Might have to do a little stash dive and see what I've got. The next one I have for you is the Fair Isle cardigan. This is part of a twin set pattern. And this is also knitted in Exelana 4 ply, 100% British wool. And... It's Fair Isle, but it's only got two small sections of Fair Isle on the front, um, on the shoulders, on the front only, not on the back. The front two pieces of the cardigan. It has a small area just adorning the shoulders. The rest of it is all plain, which should make it quite quick to knit the rest of it. The interesting thing about this particular pattern that I think is quite cool is the box head sleeve. So it almost looks like at the top of the sleeve like there's a flap that's that's over that flips over. So it's almost like doubled over at the very top of the sleeve of the shoulder and so this gives it a kind of puffed out look. Um almost as though you have uh, uh, sh uh shoulder pads in it. Now 
what you you are supposed to have knitted shoulder pads in either this or the jumper that goes underneath it. And they would can you imagine? Like they would have been knitted literally knitted shoulder pads. It's quite cool. And um if you're gonna wear both of them, you're probably not gonna want uh shoulder pads in both of them, but I'm only talking about the cardigan here because I think the cardigan would be quite cool again to wear on its own. The colours are quite muted. The main colour is um, Nile Green, which is a minty green shade. Again, super vintage look on the colourway. But again, you could pick something a little bit more jazzy if you wanted to, um, or a bit more bold to bring the look of it up to a bit more of a modern look really or to suit your particular colouring and what colours look good on you or what colours uh, make you feel good which is more important let's face it you could swap those out to match with those so that is the Fair Isle cardigan again quite a fan of a, a cheeky twin set I did have a twin set another very vintagey looking twin set that was a cardigan and top that went underneath it. Can't believe I chucked half this stuff out because no, I'm like, again, it was Lurex with lots of sparkly bits in. Um, but I would totally be like kicking the arse out of wearing these now again. I do still have quite a few things from when I was at uni, like a few items of clothing that do still fit. But uh, yeah, I can't believe I, I chucked that one in the end. Or my Reebok one, I had this Reebok football shirt that was like electric blue with a red yellow and orange collar with the big number one on the back of it i can't I can't, can't believe i got rid of that either anyway next one is a warm jacket with an, an unusual bubble stitch yoke this one is knit in jemison's spindrift and is really cool spindrift is a fingering weight yarn it's 100 shetland wool and this pattern is an all over one by one rib I know aggressive or what but it's got a really cool bubble stitch yoke so the yoke has its, its own kind of pattern texture pattern of its own but it stops it doesn't go very far down onto the tops of the arms like some yokes it definitely stops on that outside edge of the shoulder which I think looks quite cool it's got a ton of buttons down the front so this was a 1940s pattern but obviously must have been towards the end of the 1940s to have so many buttons on it as aforementioned and it doesn't have ribbed hems and cuffs because the whole thing is one by one rib so to get the negative ease for this you have to change your needle size which is, again, it's just something a bit different, you know, something you don't normally do with modern patterns. But it's another kind of technique or something you could use if you wanted to add a little bit of cheeky fit here and there. Learning these these quick cheats that would have been very popular and very common back then is, is you know, is a really cool way of doing things. Now, even in like a four-ply wool, this cardigan will because it's a rib it'll be really cozy i think and good for sort of autumn springtime where you don't want to wear a big coat be sweating your knackers off um but you do need something with a little bit of a thermal properties really just for that when the weather changes quite quickly aspect of things and I've had a, a, a worn a lot of garments made out of like pro, what I call proper wool, not merino, basically proper wool. And they are really warm and you can get away without a coat because you've got these. So I think it would be really good for that where you don't want that bulk, especially like when you're shopping and you've got to go like from outside, which is freezing to inside, which is a million degrees. And then you're sweating, like it's not good. So this would be a good option for that because it would be warm enough for the outsidey parts basically so that is a warm jacket with an unusual bubble stitch yoke the next one i've got for you is the warm jumper and this one honestly could be a pattern that's just come out and been written today it is really quite flexible it doesn't have the super vintagey look that some of the other patterns do where you like that it's definitely super vintage now maybe that could be some of the choice of the color that of the yarn that's used but I also think it is just one of those sort of shapes that have kind of survived the test of time and we still see all over everywhere used today so this one again is knitting excellent excellent four ply uh 100 
Peony British Wool from Susan Crawford Vintage and it is a long sleeved v-neck jumper. The v-neck is a two by two rib and then it's textured all over where it's got like a vertical line of rib which separates the pattern and the pattern is again like a rib that crosses over so it looks like little wavy crossed x's going across in horizontal bands uh, that are then separated by a different stitch it looks like it's changed from uh, one stitch to in fact it's reverse stocking stitch now i can see it's quite difficult to see on the picture because it's a dark color it's in cornflower this one so it's in a a blue that you're still going to see around all the time anyway I think this is one of those jumpers that you would you definitely just wear all the time you could throw it on when you're going out when you have it in a bag that you, so you can kind of like throw it on obviously if you've got a shirt underneath it it's going to look fine it's a v-neck and it's such a versatile pattern that I think you could pick up any sort of you know, especially a high twist um, yarn and that would look quite good on this because of the stitch definition. The high twist will really make all of these uh, cables and textured details pop out. So I'd, I'd go for one of the, if I was doing it, I would go for one. I, either I'd go for Super Twist Sock, uh, Nurturing Fibres, or I would go for one of the uh, high twist BFL yarns um, that we get from a lot of indie dyers here in the UK. Last, but by no means least, and one of my favourites actually, just because I think it's going to be a super wearable piece, and I've already got some similar shaped uh, items like this that I've actually already bought this year, is the sports sweater. So this is the 1950s designs, and it is a short-sleeved, um, very deep v-neck like below the kind of bust line v-neck top that is done in Jamison Spindrift again it's got cap sleeves and it's all done in a fancy rib stitch so although it's only a four ply yarn the resulting fabric looks to be like it's knitted from a thicker ply yarn this one is done in like a burgundy colour and is styled with a long sleeved vintage blouse underneath and a brooch on it i think this would look super cool with um just a plain you know round neck top even just the ones you get from marks and spencers or wherever just a plain cotton top with this over the top and some jeans with boots perhaps would be very cool it would also look really cool with a skirt knee length skirt and um and some cool tights maybe lots and lots of options for this and again one of those things that you can kind of pull on and, and pull off and it would end up being be one of those sort of staple pieces that you were always turning to it is a, quite a quick knit because obviously it's not got sleeves and with the deep v-neck there's like part of the front is you know the front the front piece is much a much smaller piece to knit which is cool and like this again i feel like, like it looks quite 70s i've just bought some linen and cotton blend tops um in a very similar design to this uh, to wear just with jeans or whatever uh, round and about i would probably knit this one i would do it in the jamesons for sure if i could find the right color i would go for it in the jamesons but i also think it would look quite cool actually in a mohair blend with a bit of floof on it the floof would hide some of the fancy rib stitch but i think the design lends itself to be in suitable for adding something with a little bit of something something in it so maybe some fluff maybe a little bit of sparkle love a bit of sparkle something like that equally you could do it in a, a, a workhorse four ply and it like, like your jamesons and it would be fab so that is the sports sweater. So all of these patterns are in the Stitching Time Volume 2 book. You can get that from susancrawfordvintage.com. The Jan sweater is available separately, priced at £6 on Susan Crawford Vintage website. You can get it on Ravelry as well. Please be aware there's still issues ongoing with Ravelry. And um, 
You can get the other patterns as part of the book, which is £35 print only or £25 for PDF only. And you can get those from Susan Crawford Vintage. There, there's 80 designs in this book. So I've picked out five. There's at least another five that I would definitely knit anyway myself. And I'm probably just going to work through and make that into a project for myself, like to add to my handmade wardrobe. Um aspirations shall we say and using up my stash aspirations and um, 80 designs like I, I don't even know the maths but it's not very much per pattern to get that and the book is beautiful definitely worth getting um if you if that's outside your budget then I know this book also went into quite a lot of the libraries I think a copy of it is in the British library as well obviously if you're not in Britain you're not going to get that right there but there, there are options for borrowing this book from 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 elsewhere as well as far as i'm aware but i mean in terms of like super value for what you get like it is it is very very competitive for the number of designs that you get so that is my top five must knits from susan crawford vintages a stitch in time volume two have you knit anything from this book I'm interested to hear, especially if you have been working on a handmade wardrobe, um, maybe you're doing some sewing. I know a lot of listeners that I follow are begin to sew in their own garments as well. But if you've knitted anything from this book or you've got a particular favourite pattern or any you know good information to share, particularly about yarns that will work for this, if maybe the slightly more robust woolly yarns that are traditionally used for this are not suitable for people, it would be super to hear from you. So please let me know. You can email me info at shinybees.com or tag me on socials or you can you can be in my DMs. I'm, I'm okay with the DMs as well. And I'll be putting a thread about this over in our Mighty Network when that is all ready to go, which I'm hoping will be next week. And then we can kind of, you know, share ideas and resources and all that kind of good stuff in one place rather than me trying to pull, remember, and then pull everything together uh, to share with all of you. So that's all I've got time for this week. I hope you've enjoyed the show. I will be back again with you next week. But until then... Have a lovely time. Happy crafting. And I will speak to you all again soon. Cheers. You've been listening to the Shiny Bees podcast. Show notes for this episode can be found on the website at shinybees.com forward slash one five five. Music for this episode is provided with kind permission of Admiral Walker Boys and his I Need a Drink, which you can find on iTunes.